Hi guys, Mark Dawes, NFPS Limited, and welcome to this blog post. Now, straight from the off, I've got some seriously interesting information for you. The Security Industry Authority, the SIA, have now granted an exception to those of you who may have undertaken the BTEC Level 2 Award in Disengagement and Physical Intervention Skills Training. Now, what that means is that if at any time during the last three years you have attained a BTEC Level 2 Award, in Disengagement and Physical Intervention Skills Training, this is the award that's on the QCF, it's a 30 hour award, then you are not required to undertake the Physical Intervention Module of the Door Supervisor's License to Practice Award if you are undertaking your Door Supes course for the first time or if you're going for your license renewal. Now that's a really interesting exemption. The Level 2 I've just talked about, the BTEC Level 2 in Disengagement and Physical Intervention Skills, is actually on the national framework. So if you are a trainer and you are an edXL centre, you can actually gain authority to run that right now. And if you're watching this and you're one of our licensed centres, then drop me an email and we'll give you the right to actually deliver that through our centre as an additional award. The beauty and the benefit of this Level 2 Disengagement and Physical Intervention Award, as compared to the SIA PI module, is this. The SIA PI module only allows for non-restrictive physical intervention skills and non-aggressive breakaway and disengagement skills to be taught within the scope of the License to Practice Award. This award, however, covers more restrictive techniques. So by default, it's going to be, generally speaking, more fit for purpose. Now that also puts an accountability and responsibility on you if you're a trainer, because it want, you, know, you have to make sure that you're actually teaching stuff that is valid, is in date, you're not teaching techniques that have been outlawed or banned. So it's giving you more onus and more credibility and more scope as to what you can deliver, thus making the award more fit for purpose. And that's a really, really important thing. So for those of you delivering door supervisors training, you deliver the level four module, or the unit four module, beg your pardon, for the PI unit. And a lot of the feedback you're probably getting is it's great, it's a nice low, no level entry system, but it doesn't go far enough. And we hear that time and time again. And as the SIA have said time and time again, if you are an employer of door supervisors or you own a venue and you are engaging door supervisors on a contract or subcontracted basis, then you have to make sure that if it's required, that top-up training is provided. But where do you go for top-up training? You can have some people teaching really good stuff and you can have some people teaching really mad stuff. The beauty of this award is it is an award that's on the national framework, it's written to a national standard and of course, all the other accreditations go with it. So not only will it deliver what's required for licensing, it's also a good top-up award and therefore more fit for purpose. And that brings me on to the next point. And by the way, before I go to the next point, if you click below this video, you can go to our webpage and find out a lot more about this level two award in disengagement and physical intervention skills training. And as I've already said, if you're a licensed center, get in touch and we'll give you the license to run it. No problem there whatsoever. Now, this brings me on to the next point. And that is something called striking the balance. And you may have seen this. It's a document that you can get off the HSC website called striking the balance. And it's basically aimed at police authorities and police service areas. And it's designed to address the issue where the police, for example, have not gone far enough under, you know, to extend a duty of care to someone when, when actually dealing with crime disorder. And I'm sure you've heard stories of PCSOs not wanting to jump in, in rivers or ponds or a police officer, you know, not going to rescue someone because under so-called health and safety laws that they're not allowed to do so. Well, I'm going to come on to this more on later videos, but this is a really important issue uh, for those of you out there delivering training and for those of you commissioning training. Technically speaking now, and you may have heard this in the press and you've seen it on blog posts before, the police are now basically not going to attend to calls from assistance from A&E departments and mental health units. And we've had a lot of trainers and a lot of agencies already contact us about this for advice and guidance as to what they need to do. Because the police, quite rightly, are saying, look, our job is crime and disorder. We're not mental health nurses. We're not social workers. We don't have the skills to actually deal with these people on an ongoing basis. And dealing with mental health issues are clogging up their system. So technically speaking, if you are a mental health unit or you, you deal with people who have challenging behavior, um, people who are at risk, who are vulnerable in our society, but you're having to, to physically control them, maybe to a high level, you can't now rely on the police coming. Because under this striking the balance remit, if it is foreseeable that you're gonna to have to restrain someone and that is beyond the scope and your capabilities, then you need to actually deal with that as an organization. You need to train to a higher level or you need to get additional equipment in. 
because you cannot rely on the police coming because they're probably not, unless of course it is a life-threatening situation. The other aspect of striking the balance, which is another one to consider within the realms of restraint, is if we know that we've got restraint going on for a prolonged period of time, then we need to deal with that. We need to actually manage that because the evidence shows that a prolonged restraint increases the risk and the margin of error and it's been identified as a factor in a number of restraint-related deaths. So if you've got a prolonged restraint going on and that's foreseeable, to strike the balance, if you like, to manage that, to protect the people who are at risk that you deal with, you need to reduce that restraint down to its lowest possible time scale and avoid techniques, by the way, such as prone, supine, neck locks and other techniques that are going to increase the risk of death. And that may mean looking, at least looking, and investigating the use of equipment, restraint-related equipment. There you are. I bet some of you have thrown your hands up in horror now. Now I'm saying it. You need to look at handcuffs. You need to look at soft cuffs. You need to look at ERBs. You need to look at what you can use in addition to just allow, you know, enabling your staff to go on on a manual basis and physically be expected to control someone who's posing a high level of risk. Now we've done lots of work in this, we've done extensive work with this, we've, we've talked to agencies, we've worked with agencies, we've come up with some cracking um, things that we can do. Mark Williams, who I know many of you will know watching this video, is, has produced a set of emergency response cuffs, soft cuffs, they're a fantastic piece of kit. We, we can train handcuffs, we have the emergency response belt, and even something as simple as a beanbag sometimes can actually reduce the amount of time that someone's restrained for and reduce the risk to staff. So what I'm saying to you is, is if you are looking, genuinely looking at a minimizing restraint strategy, so you are aiming to reduce restraint, which is what a lot of government departments are now striving for, and they expect you to do the same, that it's not just about reducing how many times you restrain per se, it's also about reducing the amount of time you restrain for, and under health and safety, if you're striking the balance, it's about reducing the overall risk. Therefore, that means looking at additional equipment. Now, I'm going to come back to this on, on, on blog posts later on. I'm going to give you a lot more information on this because it is quite a serious issue. Um, as I've said, government departments are looking at this and inspectors should be coming out um, uh, to look at what we're doing, uh, to look at what you're doing, should I say. Sorry, excuse me on that one, uh, in terms of your overall restraint reduction strategy. But that's all for now. Uh, as I've said to you before, there's a link below this to the exclusion from the from the SIA regarding the disengagement and physical intervention skills training module. And if you want to know more about that, drop us a line, pick up the phone, drop me an email, be happy to hear from you. Thanks ever so much for listening.